الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين We uh, continue insha'Allah on our study of the Umayyad dynasty the uh, period of time that extended from the 60th year of the Hijrah of the Prophet, the 41st uh, year after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on into the year 132 after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, established a large Muslim empire, if you will, large Muslim state that uh, remained uh, stretched out for centuries to, to come. And we, uh, alhamdulillah, we went on and we studied many of the khila, uh, khalifa of the Bani Umayyah. And inshallah tonight, we'll try to finish this chapter of our history, finish the study of the Umayyah dynasty and the Umayyah state, and move on and see how things moved on to from the Umayyah dynasty to the Abbasi dynasty to the Abbasids. How did that transformation happen? What actually brought on the downfall of a, a, a dynasty like the dynasty of Umayyah who were in control, who were really the superpower of the world, known world at that time, how did that happen? And uh, we studied up to the seventh Khalifa of Bani Umayyah, or the eighth if you count Marwan, if you count Marwan ibn Hakam, who was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was really, his time was the highlight of the time of Bani Umayyah. He was the shining star for all the reasons that we uh, mentioned in the last three sessions and how his time uh, in the Khilafah, although was short, uh, two years and few months, uh, really made a lasting impression, lasting impact on our Islamic history. And any time you mention uh, the great Khalifa, the guided Khalifa, he is always counted as the fifth guided Khalifa after Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, uh, Radwanullahi alayhim ajma'een. And we continue inshallah today, we got into this point, uh, if you're following on the slides, the Khilafah of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the year 101, and then we will study quickly the Umayyads after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. The time after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was different from the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. The Umayyad dynasty, who allegedly in many book histories basically poisoned Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and got rid, of, got rid of him. They did not want to get rid only of the person, they wanted to get rid of the entire policy that he was bringing to the Ummah. And after him, the Khalifa that uh, was given the Khilafah was Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. Uh, Yazid ibn Abdul Malik, if you look at this, he is the, the uh, fourth uh, he is the third son of Abdul Malik bin Marwan to get the Khilafah and the fourth one was Hisham ibn Abdul Malik and in that there is a nice story that Sa'id ibn Musayyib uh, was uh, told about a dream uh, that Al-Walid ibn Abd, that Abd Malik ibn Marwan has seen in his uh, sleep and he interpreted that that four of his children will become Khalifa so Yazid ibn Abdul Malik uh, was uh, the third Khalifa of the children of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and he was the eighth Khalifa in uh, the house of Umayyah. Uh, when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz died, people knew what they had. People were very happy with the way Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was conducting their affairs. They were really a, 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 pa a complete state of satisfaction with the way that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz went back to the path of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the path of the guided Khalifa. So the first thing Yazid ibn Abdul Malik did, is he promised to go on and continue the same correction path that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was following. And uh, reading directly from uh, the book of as the history of the Khilafah, or Tariq al-Khulafa, and... Uh, he said, according to this book, Yazid said, "Ma Umar bi ahwaja ila Allah minni." Umar doesn't need Allah subhanahu wa taala more than I do. Meaning, I also need Allah subhanahu wa taala. I need to be uh, on His path. And uh, as is reported, he uh, continued to work the way Umar did for forty days, and then after that, he changed 
the ways of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So he started with the intention to move on and continue the correction of the corrections of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And important events happened in the Khilafah of Yazid ibn Abdul Malik, although this was a short Khilafah, it was only four years. But in that, a major revolution happened in the uh, area of Al-Iraq. And in that, Yazid ibn al-Muhallab, al-Muhallab ibn Abi Sufra, Yazid ibn al-Muhallab, the house of al-Muhallab, was uh, in very close to the uh, Umayyah Khilafah initially, and, and al-Muhallab ibn Abi Sufra himself was one of the great leaders of Umayyah, and then things changed and uh, got into a conflict with the Khilafah and the house of Al-Muhallab was brought down and uh, his uh, children were prosecuted. And Yazid ibn Al-Muhallab, who was also one of the leaders of Umayyah, became an, a, a renegade, became a person who was not wanted by Umayyah at that time. And he uh, went on and he rebelled against the Khilafah. And he had a lot of supporters in Al-Iraq. And, uh, and there was a, great, a big battle in, called the Battle of Al-Aqir. And this battle in Al-Aqir happened close to the, to the place of Karbala. And in that, the armies of Umayyah met with the armies of Yazid ibn al-Muhallab. And Al-Yazid ibn al-Muhallab was defeated and he was killed. Uh, but this was a major revolt against the people of Umayyah and it happened during the time of Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. Yazid ibn Abdul Malik did not uh, uh, govern for a long time and there is not much really reported of his Khilafah other than many of the privileges that were taken away from Bani Umayyah during the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz returned back to the people of Umayyah. So things went back to what was considered the norm for Bani Umayyah. After that, the second uh, ter- the, ter- the term after that is the term of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, who is the fourth child, the first son of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan to get the Khilafah. And what uh, really uh, distinguishes the term of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, it's number one, it's very long, it's 20 years. He is the longest governing uh, Umayyad Khalifa to, to take the Khilafah after... Uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Through the whole time he is the longest to govern the Muslim world. And he governed that for 20 years. And he uh, had a good reputation in the history books. Uh, Many report that he was wise. And he was a good person in general. And he had a lot of piety. He did not make the corrective changes that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz did. But oppression during his time also was not uh, rampant. They were not. They were, the, the rule of Bani Umayyah was softer during the time of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. And uh, one of these, uh, he has many achievements, and uh, one of them is building a city which is still standing in Iraq called Ar Rusafa. He built the city of Ar Rusafa in Iraq, and he uh, planned uh, the the uh, the city. He also continued the jihad against the Byzantine, and in his name, in his time, the city of Caesarea uh, was conquered, or Qaisariya, as it's reported in the uh, Islamic books. Uh, other thing of uh, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, some of the negative things that happened is the increased the zealotry, the tribal zealotry among the leaders and and the Umayyah. Uh, time and now we will go into that in a little bit of details, uh, but uh, will not bore you with too many details about the tribal conflict. But basically, there were two big factions that are competing inside the house of Umayyah, and these two factions were the uh, Arab who are the Arabs who are considered Yemeni Arab who are from the they are descendants from Qahtan and the Arabs that are considered Mustariba, who are uh, really where the Prophet ﷺ come from, and they are the descendants of Nizar. So there was those Arabs who are called the Arab Al-Qahtani, and the Arabs who are called the Arab Al-Nizari, and from them there's bigger uh, tribes like Mudar, Rabi'a, Waqais. Now these names may not be very important now, but at that time, 
they made a lot of difference and only in the time of Bani Umayyah because Bani Umayyah started using these tribal differences in getting allegiance and in getting these tribes to compete for their closeness to Bani Umayyah and they started favoring part one one tribes over the others and and we know from history once favoritism start in in uh, the state or in anything it really creates a lot of animosity i mean in in somebody's own house if you have two children and you start favoring one over the other then hatred will actually start between the two children for no reason just because one is favoring one over the other and the same thing really happens at a larger scale in the world of politics if there is favoritism for a certain ethnic group for a certain uh, uh, tribal uh, association animosity will be created and that's what happened that's happened really through a century it grew and, and became very uh, very severe and very uh, rampant and very important during the end of the time of Umayyah and we will see how that really brought down the house of Umayyah uh, but that is one of the things that took time to develop during the time of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan however he was uh, known for his forbearance for his forgiving one of the things that are reported of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik is uh, one time uh, he was in the marketplace and uh, he had a, an argument with the man so he said a bad word to that person and the man said uh, he said aren't you embarrassed to curse to, to cuss me to, to tell me bad words while you are the Khalifa and many of the other uh, governors or the leaders of Bani Umayyah would have the sword as an answer for something like that but Hisham ibn Abdul Malik uh, be, was embarrassed from that comment and he said uh, well you have the right to punish me and this modesty this humbleness is really not known about many of the Khalifa of Bani Umayyah he said why don't you punish me uh, he said فَقْتَصَّ minni." and they said the man was even he was really wise when he said he said if I curse you back then I'll be like you he said فَأَنَا سَفِيهٌ مِثْلُكُ and this really is an insulting comment against the Khalifa because the man said I will not go down to your level <laughs> he's saying that to the Khalifa so people thought that this is really the end of this man's life but it wasn't that and then Hisham ibn al-Malik said فَخُذْ مِنِّي عِوَضًا مِنَ الْمَالِ he said take compensation money take you know uh, money to to compensate for, for the insult that I told you and the man refused. He said, I will not take compensation. So the Khalifa even became more humble. And he said, Forgive me for the sake of Allah. If you don't want to forgive me for because I'm requesting that, you don't want to forgive me for money, then just forgive me for the sake of Allah. And then he said, I will forgive you for the sake of Allah and then for your own sake. So Hisham... Uh, humbled himself more and he said Wallahi la a'udu li mithliha abadan Wallahi I will never curse anyone again I will never use bad words with anyone again that just this is this is really important in many books and it just tells you about the personality of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik so he was a good person overall there is no bad uh, really things that are reported about his khilafa in general and there are always bad reports that you will find about anybody in Bani Umayyah because of the animosity and the enmity that was created between Umayyah and the Shia. So there will always be things that you can read that are negative about any Khalifa in Bani Umayyah. But many of the things that are really reported in most of the books of the Ahl Sunnah and, and the Tarikh al-Khulafa, Musiyuti, which is a great reference, you will find all positive remarks about Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. Rahimahullah. After that, things really took a drastic change. Uh, Al-Walid ibn Yazid ibn Abdul Malik came. Al-Walid, who is called Al-Walid al-Thani, the second Walid. The first Walid who is uh, Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, right? The first Walid is Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. This is the second Walid who is his nephew, who is the son of Yazid ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, and he is the tenth Khalifa in the house of Umayyah. And I can just give you the nickname that is reported about this Khalifa in the history books and in Tarikh al Khulafa to know what kind of a Khalifa he was, he was called Al Khalifa al Fasiq. He was called Al Khalifa the Fasiq. Now, Khalifa and a Fasiq, two words 
do not really uh, match together very well. Uh, he was the Khalifa who was the, the sinner, who was the Khalifa, that uh, transgressor. And he was known for his uh, addiction to alcohol. And he was known for his uh, indulgence in uh, the uh, sexual uh, and the, pl- the world of pr- pleasures and many, many things that are reported about him. And even uh, some exaggeration got, came to say that he was not, he went out of Islam, he was not really a true believer. But in, in the many books, including the Tariq al-Khulafat al you will see that they, they, pref- they prefer the opinion that this was an exaggeration against Al-Walid. He was a... a an alcoholic, if for the lack of a better word, he was really a drug, uh, an, an addict. He was addic- addicted to pleasures. He was addicted to drinking, and uh, but it's not reported that he actually uh, rejected the call of Islam. And this is according to Imam al Zahabi. But what is important in that is he gave an excuse, a good excuse for the next Khalifa to actually uh, perform one of the first coups that are known in our history because Yazid ibn al-Walid who is the Khalifa to follow him who is the son of al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik who is the son of al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik he actually killed his cousin he killed Al-Walid and he jumped on the Khilafah and he revol- revolted against Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. And uh, he was called, his nickname is Yazid, you will see his name is Yazid al-Thalith, the third Yazid. The first Yazid is Yazid ibn Muawiyah, the second was Yazid is the Yazid ibn Abdul Malik and the third Yazid is Yazid ibn Al-Walid. And, but his more known nickname in history is Yazid al Naqis. And uh, Yazid al-Naqis, he is uh, one of the people that uh, uh, really governed for a very short time. And his whole uh, life in the Khilafah was six months. But he started his Khilafah by killing his cousin Yazid and declaring himself the Khalifa. And after he killed his son, he uh, gave a speech and he said wallahi inni ma kharajtu asharan wala bataran wala tama'an wala hirsan ala dunya wala raghbatan fil mulk he said i did not come out and kill my cousin and and you know take the khilafa because i am i'm a greedy person or not because i'm an evil person and not because i love the dunya and not because i want to be a king not because i want to be the governor he said, وَإِنِّي لَظَلُومُ نَفْسِي لَمْ يَرْحَمْنِي رَبِّي And I asked the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I would be a transgressor against myself if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not forgive me for what happened. وَلَكِنِّي خَرَجْتُ غَضَبًا لِلَّهِ وَدِينِ But I did what I did because I got angry for what is happening to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَدَاعِيًا إِلَى كِتَابِهِ وَسِنَّةِ نَبِيهِ And I was, I'm a caller to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm a caller to the way of his prophet. So he said, then, uh, and this is a really long speech, but I'll just give you some of the highlights. What, what he is doing, he said, he is justifying his coup against his cousin because of the sins of his cousin. He said, he has taken the Khilafah into a, an unprecedented uh, uh, way of the Khalifa, who is, which who is to be the role model for the Ummah. He is the role model for piety, should be the role model for Islam is actually being called among the people al khalifa al fasiq So he said this uh, is not the way of Islam and he is justifying his act that way. And he said I uh, made the choice to do what I did after uh, consulting and after uh, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the guidance. He was 35 years old and he governed for 6 months and then he died. And uh, the... Uh, Reports in history, he was not killed, he just died, and he died in, uh, in a disease, in the plague. He desi- died in the plague. So that takes us to the last Khalifa. To the last uh, person, the last Khalifa, who is Marwan ibn Muhammad. Now in some books you will read that there, will, there was somebody between Yazid and Marwan, between Yazid ibn al-Walid and Marwan Muhammad, and that is Ibrahim 
who is Yazid's brother, Al-Ibrahim ibn Al-Walid ibn Abd al-Malik. But uh, in, in the history books, there is a dispute whether he was actually given bay'ah for khilafah at all, even inside the house of Umayyah. So in many books, he is not counted. And uh, he was a khalifa in the books that count him as a khalifa for 70 days. So he was really, for a very short period of time, it seems that there is a problem in the house of Abdul Malik bin Marwan. And this is explained in history, as you see now, the house of Abdul Malik bin Marwan with four khalifa in the first generation after Abdul Malik and two khalifa in the second generation, there are many male people in that house that want to have the khilafah for themselves. But now it jumped into the house of Muhammad bin Marwan. It, it really jumped a generation up. You see in the, in the, if you following the slides, in the house of Abdul Malik bin Marwan, that first generation passed and it went into the second generation who are the grandchildren of uh, Abdul Malik bin Marwan. But then it went back generation up, but it went to the house of, Mu- of uh, Muhammad ibn Marwan ibn al-Hakam and his son Marwan ibn Muhammad who became the 12th and the last Khalifa in the house of Umayyah. Uh, Marwan, uh, ibn al- Marwan ibn Muhammad was the last Khalifa of Bani Umayyah and his uh, reign lasted for five years, the last five years of the dynasty of Umayyah. These five years in the dynasty of Umayyah were really characterized by a lot of violence by huge unrest. And we saw how Bani Umayyah really survived many of these unrest period. They survived so many revolts, but it finally caught up with them. It finally got to the point that Bani Umayyah, the the downfall of Bani Umayyah was brought during the time of Marwan ibn Muhammad. And what is reported in in many of the history books that his entire Khilafah was war, fighting, running from one place to the other, putting out a revolt here and a revolt there. And we will talk about that a little bit before we close the curtains on the dynasty of Umayyah. The fall of the Umayyahs and the rise of the Abbasids is really what we are going to talk about tonight. And we will sell, we saw how Bani Umayyah deviated from the path of the guided Khilafah. And uh, I read actually, I did some research and I did many books and they all really count the same reasons why the people of Umayyah fell down and uh, wh- why the dynasty f- f- has fallen. And the number one is really just the concept of the dynasty. And that is that explains just the conflicts that happen among the, khil- the Khalifa themselves. We saw how a cousin is killing a cousin, how Marwan ibn Muhammad is jumping on uh, somebody else in his family and trying to re- d- demote him from the Khilafah. How Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik wanted his son instead of his brother. And many, many conflicts within the same family for the, for the seat, for the throne, for who becomes a Khalifa. That would not happen if the, the, the concept of the Khilafah goes back to the Shura. Because there is no, it, it's not really a custody, it's not a gift you give to someone, it is something that is a responsibility that is laid on somebody. And we saw how when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he is the best Example of that is when he was given the Khilafah, he was not happy, he was crying, he was described as his head was between his knees, and he just kept repeating, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. This was the true meaning of the Khilafah, it is not something you fight for, it is something that is really laid on you. And the second thing is that tribal zealotry. There has been big d- division inside the Umayyad dynasty between the, the, uh, the many of the Arab tribes. And then the other thing is really forming those political and military alliances inside the government. And we will talk about that in a little bit. Many of the groups that were inside the dynasty of the Umayyad started developing alliances. Some tribes allied themselves with the house of Al-Muhallab ibn Abi Sufra. Some houses allied themselves with the house of Al-Hajjaj. Now when Al-Hajjaj becomes undesirable, then that connection to Al-Hajjaj brought destruction on the people that allied themselves with Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. And we saw what happened to Qutayba ibn Muslim al-Bahili. We saw what happened to many other just because of their connection to Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. And the same thing happened to people that allied themselves with the house of uh, Al-Muhallab ibn Abi Sufra. It was really a political world, like today's politics in a way. It was all poisoned with all 
these relations, all these alliances that have no place in Islam. Islam is about what is good for Muslims, what is good for the Ummah. That's what the Prophet ﷺ worked on. And the Prophet ﷺ would not let alliances happen among his Sahaba between the Muhajireen and Al-Ansar. We remember one time when the Prophet ﷺ was out in a battle and a man of Al-Muhajireen and a man of the Ansar started having a conflict uh, on the well about who to draw water. And they, they had an, uh, sort of an altercation and the Muhajir started uh, sh- shouting, O oh, Muhajireen, Ya Lal Muhajireen. And the Ansari started uh, crying, Wa Lal Ansar. And the people started to help. The Muhajireen came to help the Muhajir and the Ansari came to help the Ansari. And the Prophet ﷺ heard it. And he got out of his tent and he was very angry. And his face was red. And he said, Abi da'wa al-jahiliyyati wa ana bayna zahranaykum. You, you speak the, the words of the jahiliyyah, the times of ignorance, at the time of zealotry, and I'm still amongst you. And he said, da'uha fa'innaha muntina. Leave it. It stinks. It is disgusting. This calling for association, whether in any group, other to associate yourself with the groups of Muslims. So no national alliances, no tribal alliances, no ethnic alliances, all of that is called by the Prophet as stinky, disgusting alliances outside the alliances of the Islam. And that was one of the main issues that really led to the downfall of the people of Umayyah. Bani Umayyah were very zealous on holding on to power. And many times, many historians say, Alaykum salam that that led them to many wrong decisions that actually halted the progress of many conquests and some of the examples is uh, what making Musa bin Nusayr and Tariq bin Ziyad stop and bring him to Damascus while they were at their peak uh, some say it was because of fearing that the army would be lost in Europe and some others said no it was because these people were getting great importance and they may become later on a threat to the house of Umayyah. One of the examples is Qutaybah bin Muslim al-Bahili, who was beloved among the uh, uh, people of uh, what is today, uh, the, the uh, uh, what is what we call beyond the river, the, the areas of uh, Middle Asia, the old uh, Islamic Soviet uh, alliances. But he was a beloved leader there. And he was called and he was killed because his star was, was shining brighter. And the same thing with Muhammad ibn al-Qasim al-Thaqafi. The, the people of Umayyah would think that they now would cause, would pose a threat to the power, to the central power in Umayyah. And that led to many uh, wrong decisions and to many good lives lost uh, in that uh, path. One of the things that led to the downfall of Umayyah is oppressing the Shia. Instead of after settling things to trying to stretch an arm of... Uh, really uh, reconciliation with the supporters of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And it happened with many of the people like many, like Al-Hasan ibn Ali himself gave his allegiance to Muawiyah, gave his bay'ah to Muawiyah. Uh, the people of Umayyah, instead of really embracing that, they started cursing Ali on the mimba. They started attacking the power uh, that even after Ali radiallahu anhu died, they started making, sh- they wanted to make sure that his group, his alliance, what is called at that time the Shia, and we will talk about the divisions a little bit later on, inshallah tonight, they still suppressed them, they still oppressed them, and they still made sure that these people will never have a hold on power again. Now by that oppression, by that persecution, the many of the Shia of Ali radiallahu anhu became defensive, they actually organized themselves, and that led directly to the downfall of the house of Umayyah. The other thing that led to the downfall of Umayyah is the distraction by wealth and power from the real message of the Khilafah. We spoke over that, we said how that was more important to many of the governors of Umayyah than spreading Islam, than bringing people. And what that led to, is really a state of discrimination among the rulers who were the Umayyah and the alliances from the Arabic tribes to the people that were under them who were non-Arabs in many of the new uh, and new territories. And that actually was another direct cause 
of the downfall of Umayyah. Where did the downfall of Umayyah come from? From Khurasan. And the, the one that actually started calling the people to attack Umayyah and to uh, organize themselves against Umayyah was Abu Muslim al-Khurasani. And one of his, uh, the things that helped him is that clear discrimination that Umayyah was practicing against the people of that land. And his, to, to have really responders to his call was not difficult. And we will see why actually the downfall of Umayyah came from Khurasan, from that uh, eastern province. The other thing that, uh, the one other cause of what happened in the house of Umayyah, why the, the house of Umayyah was brought to its downfall, as many revolutions. Now, uh, the, the, any, rev- any revolt, followed by a revolt, fired by a revolt, it weakens, it really cracks into the, the, the power, into the, the structure of any ummah. This is actually the last revolt that I have a problem with the... Uh, but you remember, the first thing started in Karbala. 61 years after the Hijra, immediately after the dynasty concept was declared by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And transferred the Khilafah to his son Yazid. And al Hussein ibn Ali revolted against that. He refused that. Now, according to many of the Shia, especially at that time, they saw the revolt of al Hussein as a revolt, as a refusal of keeping the Khilafah in the house of Umayyah, but they thought al Hussein in their own mind, al Hussein wanted the Khilafah to, to be in the house of Fatima, under the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And many other scholars said, no, al Hussein was not revolting because he wants the Khilafah to be in the house of Fatima. He just not wanted to be the Khilafah, a, a, a tool in the, in, the, in the hands of Bani Umayyah to keep power inside the family. Islam is not a tribe. Islam is not a family. Islam was brought to the world. And many of, actually many of the scholars of a Sunnah feel that the revolt of Al-Hussein, and rightfully so, was not to hold power in his family. It was to really correct the things, to bring things to where they should be. And, but however, that was one of the major revolts against the people of Umayyah. The second one was the revolt of al Madina, which is known as the revolt of Al-Harra. We went over all of that in details, which happened two years after that, in the 63rd year after the Hijra. Then after that, the revolt of Ibn Zubair. Ibn Zubair, actually, his revolt was successful. And he became a Khalifa, and he is considered a Khalifa by many of the scholars. And his reign uh, lasted from 63rd year after the Hijrah to the 73rd year after the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. Then we have the revolt of Al Ash'ath, Ibn Al Ash'ath, Abdul Rahman ibn Al Ash'ath, who uh, revolted against Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf Thaqafi, and who also was in Khurasan, and he revolted against Al Hajjaj in Al Iraq, and that was crushed. Then you have Al Yazid ibn al Muhallab in the hundred and second year after the Hijrah who revolted against Umayyah and his revolt was crushed. Then you have Abdullah ibn Muawiyah who revolted in the hundred and twenty seventh year after the Hijrah and his revolt was crushed. And then you have the revolt of Hims and there was a revolt in Damascus. And then finally against Muhammad ibn Marwan, against Marwan ibn Muhammad who is the last, his cousin Sulaiman, the son of Hisham, Ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan revolted against him in Syria. And he had his armies in northern Syria and the province of Qanisreen, which uh, at that time the capital of which is, uh, is Aleppo or is Halab. And Marwan ibn Muhammad fought his own cousin and there were thousands and thousands of people that were lost in that particular revolt. So you just look at this map and all of these revolts against the house of Umayyah, and these are just the major ones. These are just the major ones that ended in major battles. And there are many others that tells you how, what is the, the status of people, what is the feeling of people against the government of Umayyah. So Umayyah was weakened by many revolts. It was weakened by the way of government that happened at that time. Before I go to the Abbasid and who are the Abbasid and how they came about, we would like to take a look, inshallah, on, on the government of Umayyah. Now, we said a lot of the negatives against the people of Umayyah. But again, to be objective with history and try to report history for what it is, many of the historians and the scholars, they said the people of Umayyah 
where the people who, who, who were the ulama would say خلطوا عملا صالحا وسيعا they, they mixed good deeds and bad deeds they have bad things and they have good and positive things number one the house of Umayyah established the first international state for Islam that really extended from the borders of China in Kashgir like we said to Narbonne in, in south of France and in their reign also Islam spread and many of these uh, people came into Islam and they also spread Islam north into the Caspian Sea and uh, they went into northern Africa and in the time of Umayyah there was this all intermixing between so many people and so many cultures and the people of Umayyah actually used that uh, to advance the culture, the Islamic culture that they have. And in that there was a lot of interactions with the Persians, a lot of interaction with the Byzantine, and the Greek culture and the Greek uh, philosophy and the Greek knowledge came into the Muslim world and the people of Umayyah helped advance that, but that actually peaked later on in the time of Al-Abbasiyin. Khalid ibn Yazid ibn Muawiyah he was one of the people that actually was very interested in science and he was interested especially in chemistry and he really transferred many of these uh, old knowledge from the Greek and the Byzantine into the Muslim world. Another positive thing to be said about the reign of Umayyah is really establishing the, the trade it's the trade system moving the economy forward and whether that is to advance the wealth of the Muslim Ummah or advance the personal wealth of the Umayyad dynasty but at any rate they really had organized trade and organized trade within the Muslim world and they organized trade from the Muslim world with abroad with the other nations around the Muslims uh, the building of many Muslim, many shrines for Islam, like the uh, the Dome of the Rock, which was built during the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, and Masjid al-Aqsa, which was started during the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and then finished during Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. Rebuilding Al-Kaaba uh, during the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan after it was destroyed. On, uh, in the conflict that happened between Al-Hajjaj and Abdullah bin Zubair, expanding Al-Haram, expanding the Masjid of Al-Madina, which happened when Abd Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was a governor in Medina uh, under Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Building cities, building cities. We know uh, Al-Kufa and Al-Basra built by Umar ibn Khattab. But later on, the Umayyad took that and they continue with it. Al-Hajjaj himself, Think what you will of him, but he built a city called Wasit in Al Iraq and called it Wasit. Wasit means something in the middle, and he built it between Al Kufa and Al Basra. And he wanted to be a middle city between the two extremes at that time, which he thought of Al Kufa and Al Basra. And he built that city to be a medium, a happy medium among the two, and he called it the middle one or a Wasit. And another uh, city that was built, like we said, was Al Rusafa which was built by Hisham ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And Tunis, uh, which was built by Hassan ibn Nu'man, who was a governor in North Africa in the uh, 82nd year after the Hijra. Uh, Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik built uh, the great Umayyad mosque in Aleppo. And uh, Abdul Malik, uh, Abd Malik ibn Marwan built the great um, uh, Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, excuse me, his son Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik built the great Umayyad mosque in Damascus. We saw all these pictures in the previous sessions. Another thing is to establish the Islamic mint. They have the coins with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on and they, before that people used the Byzantine coins and the Persian coins. Now Muslims had their own mints. Then the archiving records, now it, they have new Islamic archiving records and many of the old archiving records of the Byzantine and the Coptic, which was titled in the name of the son, the father, etc. The, the, the uh, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi and Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, they had Qul huwa Allahu Ahad instead, and they transformed later on the language from Persian uh, and, or from uh, Byzantine, Byzantine from, Rome, uh, from the Latin, I should say the Byzantine language which is Latin into the Arabic language. 
So many positive things also happen during the reign of Bani Umayyah. And we heard about all the negative thing, things. But inshallah we will come now to the events that, that really was associated with the downfall of Bani Umayyah. <coughs> First, we know who the downfall of Bani Umayyah happened on the hands of Al Abbasiyin. So, who are Al Abbasiyin? Who are the Abbasid? Why are they called Al Abbasiyin? Who did they, how did they come from? How did they actually become to the state of power? Al Abbas. Al-Abbasiyin belong, they, they take their name from Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib. Now, Abd manaf is the uh, patriarch of the four families in Quraysh of them. Uh, the the uh, grandfathers are Al-Muttalib, Hashim, Abd shams and Nawfal. Concentrate on Hashim and Abd shams the house of Bani Hashim and the house of Bani Umayyah. Abd shams his son is Umayyah ibn Abd shams and the son of Hashem is Abdul Muttalib, who is the grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of the children of Abdul Muttalib is Al-Abbas, Abu Talib, and Abdullah. Abdullah, of course, gave uh, the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the world uh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is the son of Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. Now Al-Abbas is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Abu Talib is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. To Al Abbas was born a great scholar of Islam, and his name is Abdullah ibn Abbas, who is known as one of the main scholars of Al Islam, and he is his title in in our history and in our knowledge is Turjuman al Quran, the translator of Quran, because of his well and good understanding, deep understanding of the Qur'an, and he is a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the children of Abu Talib, and there are many that are Sahaba, like Aqil ibn Abi Talib, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, is Ali ibn Abi Talib. But now we're studying really the politics of these two families, uh, after we studied the politics of that branch of Quraysh, which descends from Umayyah. Ali ibn Abi Talib, have had three sons that are well known in history. Two were born to Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they are the grandchildren of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And they are Al Hassan and Al Hussein. And the entire progeny of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the the people of the house come directly from these two grandchildren of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subqay Rasulillah. صلى الله عليه وسلم رضي الله عنهما الحسن بن علي والحسين بن علي رضي الله عنهم أجمعين. The third son is Muhammad. Muhammad ibn Ali is known in history as Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, distinguishing him from his two brothers, and and his name is Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. That's the name of his mother, al Hanafiya, who is uh, a wife of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But he is also known as Muhammad ibn Ali. To Al Abbas ibn Abd al Muttalib, his son is Abdullah ibn al Abbas, and then Ali ibn Abdullah ibn al Abbas, and he has a son, his name is Muhammad ibn Ali. Why am I trying to lead you this? Because the children of Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Abdullah ibn al Abbas are Abu al Abbas al Safah and Abu Ja'far al Mansur, who are the first Khalifa in the dynasty of Abbas, and they have a brother, his name is Ibrahim. And we will talk about all of that, inshallah, later on. But that's where the people of Al-Abbas came. These are where the Abbasi take their, their dynasty from. The first Khalifa is Abu al-Abbas ibn Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Abdullah ibn al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim, who are the cousins of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, descendants of Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Now, what happened in the Muslim world in the time after Karbala, in the time after Sufin? Now these tribulations that live on, we see the results of till today. We just need to try to understand how these groups of Muslims came about. And what is the interaction between these groups and how things transpired to actually bring the downfall of the people of Umayyah. 
Now, Al-Hasan ibn Ali, radiyallahu an, after the killing, after the murder of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al-Hasan ibn Ali became a Khalifa. He was given the bay'ah in Al-Kufa by the supporters of his father. Now, the supporters or the allies are called in Arabic Shia. This is Shia means I'm a supporter of, I'm an ally of, of somebody. And the supporters of Ali are called the Shia of Ali. So we're not going to confuse that with the religion, that the religious sect that is developed later on, but we will see how it developed. So Al-Hasan was given bay'ah by Shia, but the people, the Sham, the people of Umayyah were still holding power in Umayyah, and later on Al-Hasan ibn Ali, uh, عنه, gave his bay'ah, gave his pledge to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, and fulfilled the prediction and the prophecy of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he said about Al Hasan in Nabni Hada Sayyid that my son talking about Al Hasan is a, an honorable man and Allah will bring together two groups of the Muslims on his hands and 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 what he has done and that's what happened Allah subhanahu wa taala brought the whole Muslim world under one Khalifa who was Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. But later on, Al Hassan died, Rabbanullah Ali, and Al Hussein remains. And uh, as the Khilafah transferred from Yaz- from Muawiyah to his son Yazid, Al Hussein refused that transfer, refused that, and he re- rebelled against it. And he went out calling for the correction based on the invitation that he received from his Shia, from the Shia of Ali, from the supporters in Ali and Al Kufa. Well, we studied that in detail, but just as a reminder. On his way, Al Hussein ibn Ali to Al Kufa, the Shia, the supporters of Ali in Al Kufa, they started giving up their support. And Muslim ibn Aqil ibn Abi Talib, ibn Abi Talib, who was the cousin of Al Hussein, was murdered, was killed in Al Kufa. And later on, Al Hussein ibn Ali was slaughtered with the, many of the uh, uh, his children, his brothers, uh, the children of Ali and many others in the massacre of Karbala. And there was a sole survivor, one survivor of the children of Al-Hussein. And he was five years old. And his name was Ali. Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali. He is known in history as Ali Zain al-Abideen. Ali Zain al-Abideen. And from Ali Zain al-Abideen, there were two main imam, two main scholars, two main people that actually carried the banner of that family and they are Zayd ibn Ali wa Muhammad who is known as Muhammad al-Baqir Muhammad al-Baqir now just bear with me and and just remember these names for a second the other son of Ali ibn Abi Talib is Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya or Muhammad ibn Ali and he has a son his name is Abu Hashim now the event transpired after that when we studied the revolt of Abdullah ibn Zubair and the quest of Abdullah ibn Zubair, I should say, to bring about correction into the Muslim world and to put the Khilafah back on track. And one of the things that... Um, how much time do we have? Okay, 15 minutes. Okay, inshallah we'll be able to finish this idea and then I'll stop there. And when uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair was trying to get control over Al-Iraq, he sent one man to bring the control over Al-Iraq. And that man was Al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al-Thaqafi. Al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid has his own ambitions in having a, 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 a position in this conflict. Everybody is getting something. He wanted something and he was able to subdue Al-Iraq. In Al-Iraq, he found that most people are supporters of Ali. Most people think that the next in Khilafa after Al-Hassan, who has died, and after Al Hussein was murdered, is naturally who? The third son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is Muhammad. Now that was a concept that is go that was happening when Al Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al Thaqafi was taking control of Al Iraq. And what Al Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al Thaqafi decided to do is to denounce his allegiance to Abdullah ibn Zubair and call for the Khilafah to Muhammad ibn Ali. To Khilafah to Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, who was in Mecca and Medina at that time. He was in Hijaz. So Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya heard that this group led by al-Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid al-Thaqafi is calling him a Khalifa. Now he refused that. He said, I never accepted that. I don't want that. There is enough division in the Muslim world and you don't need a third 
Khalifa, there are already two Khalifa at that time. There is Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and Abdullah ibn Zubair. And here is this man calling for Muhammad ibn Ali to be the Khalifa in Al-Iraq. So increasing the fitna. So he denounced that. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya refused it and announced that he does not agree with Al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid. Then Al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid started calling for himself to be a Khalifa and a defendant of the rights of the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Khilafah. And he was killed later on by Mus'ab ibn Zubair, who is the brother of Abdullah ibn Zubair. But what left there is a group of Shia that decided that, this, that now who is, has the right in the Khilafah is Muhammad ibn Ali. The division among the Shia started at that time. Among the supporters of Ali started at that time. They divided into three groups. They divided into a group that is, they have their alliance with Muhammad ibn Ali. Well, Muhammad ibn Ali really did never ask for their alliance, but they call him, and he, de- he was dead later on. He died, and they said, now his son Abu Hashim should be the Khalifa, the son of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya. And uh, they were alliances, they have alliances with al-Mukhtar ibn Ubaid, who was calling for Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya to be a Khalifa, and his title was Kaysan, and they were called a Shia al Kaysaniyya. They were called the Kaysani Shia. Watch this group very well because that, they will play a major role in the downfall of Umayyah. We don't have Shia Kaysani right now. They don't exist. But at that time, they were a very important political power and a military power that actually brought down the people of Umayyah. The children of Al Hussein. Uh, were, were another group of Shia gathered around Ali Zayn al-Abideen. Ali Zayn al-Abideen radiallahu an never called for himself to be a Khalifa. But these people, the Shia of Ali, start calling him al-Imam. He is the Imam of the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that group decided that the Khalifa should stay in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That claim, although is is calling for the Khilafah to stay in the best houses of the Muslims. I mean, there is nothing above the house of the Prophet ﷺ. But in principle, it's the same claim of Bani Umayyah that they wanted to stay in the house of Bani Umayyah. The Khilafah is not, doesn't belong to any house. The Khilafah belongs to the Shura of the Muslims. And the Prophet said it should remain in Quraysh as long as Quraysh is able to handle it. And if they don't, if they can't handle it anymore, if they cannot take the responsibility, then it can go out. So the claim that the Khilafah should be limited to a house by itself was rejected by many of the scholars of Islam at that time. But that's when the Shia as a sect started developing. They said, we do not accept Imam, we do not accept the Khalifa unless they are from the house of Ali radiallahu anh. And then they became more specific and they said they have to be a Fatimi. What does that mean? That means the children of Ali that are not from Fatima, they also don't count. So they separated themselves from a Shia al Kaysaniya. So now we have the Shia al Fatimiya and we have a Shia al Kaysaniya. Al Kaysaniyin said that anybody from the house of Ali can be an Imam. And the next in succession was. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, Shia al-Fatimiyah said, no, it has to be in the house of Fatima. They have to be the descendant, direct descendant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because they are of Al al-Bayt. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya is not from Al al-Bayt because he is from Ali. And these children are the children of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then they went further. They said, it's not enough to be in the house of Fatima. You have to be from al Hussein." He cannot be a descendant of Al-Hasan to be considered an Imam. Al-Hasan was an Imam. Now they started counting the Imam and they, we know now they have 12 Imam and they're called Al-Shia Al-Imamiyya and this is how they developed. They said Ali was the first Imam, Al-Hasan was the second Imam, Al-Hussein is the third Imam and Ali is the fourth Imam, Ali Zayn al abidin is the fourth Imam. And why not the children of Al-Hasan? Hasan has many children. And we will see that many of his children actually will revolt later on against Al-Abbasi, uh, the revolution of Muhammad and Nafs al-Zakiyya and Ibrahim. They are descendants of Al-Hasan. They said, no, no, Al-Hasan cannot, the children of Al-Hasan cannot be 
and, and Imam because Al Hussein is the one that paid his life to defend the right of the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be uh, to be the imma to be the khilafa. So only his children can become khalifa. And then they transferred the khilafa to uh, the, basically there were two people, Zayd ibn Ali Zayn al Abidin wa Muhammad al Baqir. They were both scholars. Now, the, uh, the ideas of the groups around them does not reflect, I mean this is a, a disclaimer here, does not reflect, do not reflect what these great Imams had. These great Imams have many quotation in our history. They're denouncing that way of thinking altogether. They are denouncing that way of thinking altogether. They do not approve of these ideas. But this is how things developed in the Muslim world at that time. So you will see there are three distinguished groups. They are Al-Abbasis. And, and Al-Abbasi and then Al-Shia Al-Kaysaniyya who are around Abu Hashim who is the son of Muhammad ibn Ali who is Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. They got an alliance together. Muhammad ibn Ali Al-Abbasi and Abu Hisham ibn Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, who was the Imam of al Shia al-Kaysaniyya, they allied with each other. So now the allegiance of this great sect of al-Shia in al-Iraq, and extended into Persia and Khurasan, was all with the house of al-Abbas. So the da'wah al-Abbasiyya, when it started, it was a da'wah Shi'iyya. When the, the call to the to unseat Bani Umayyah and replace them, it was a call to re- for the replacement in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that's why this da'wah had a great support and a lot of support in Al Iraq. But what happened in that other sect? They would not support that, and I want you, I want us all to understand that because there will remain conflicts later on, even when Al Abbasi become in charge then the, the people that allied themselves with the children of Ali Zayn al-Abideen, number one, they had conflict among each other, I'll talk about that in a second, but they had a great conflict with al-Abbasi, who look at them as people that used them, and used the house of the Prophet ﷺ to reach the, to reach the power, and then prevented the true imams to get their, their fair share of that khilafah. The two children of Ali Zayn al-Abidin were Zayd ibn Ali and Muhammad, who is known as Muhammad al-Baqir. The son of Muhammad al-Baqir is Ja'far, who is known as Ja'far al-Sadiq. Now these are all the Imma of al-Shia. What happened when Ali Zayn al-Abidin died, then the Shia that were around Ali Zayn al-Abidin split. Some said Zayd should be the Imam, and others said no, Muhammad should be the Imam. Muhammad al-Baqir or Zayd ibn Ali. The, there were a great difference between the group around Muhammad al-Baqir that they did not recognize the right of any other Sahabi in Khilafah. Meaning, they denounced Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, they denounced Umar ibn al-Khattab, mostly, and Uthman ibn Affan. And they said, these people are not true Khalifa. So they went on to negotiate with Zayd. And they said to Zayd, if you accept Abu Bakr and Umar, if you denounce Abu Bakr and Umar, we will be with you. We will make you our Imam. And he said, I have never heard my father, my grandfather denouncing them. Ali Zayn al-Abideen, I said, how can I denounce these people? And I, I heard only my father, Ali Zayn al-Abideen, and al Hussein ibn Ali praising them. And uh, he didn't hear his, uh, obviously his uh, grandfather because he was dead when he was born. But he was the transfer from knowledge that, to tell them that these people were not denounced. I mean, Ali ibn Abi Talib himself had great relationship with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, had a great relationship with Umar. Uh, there were marriages and, and, and kinship among them. He said, I will not accept that. They said, فَإِذَنْ نَرْفُضُكْ Then we reject you. We refuse you. And he said, well, reject me. So this word, نَرْفُضُكْ نَرْفُضْ in Arabic, رَفَضَ mean rejected, expelled, or denounced. And then that group from rejecting Zayd were known as الرَّافِضَ The rejectors, the refusers. Because they did not reject, they rejected Zayd. And Zayd went on to have a group on his own. 
and his group is alive and well today and it's a sect of Shia known as a Shia Zaydiyya the Shia, the Zaydi Shia who are the Shia of Al Yemen and they do not denounce Abu Bakr they do not denounce Umar and the differences between them and the people of As-Sunnah are really brought to a minimal by many scholars and they are the closest sect of the Shia to the people of As-Sunnah and many of the scholars consider them a, a madhab uh, it's a scholar, it's a, it's a thought, it's a school of thought differences then this group, the rest of the Shia, now the Shia is three groups a Shia al kaysaniya a Shia al zaydiya and then a Shia al imamiya a Shia al imamiya are called the Imami Shia which is the Shia that is now uh, more prevalent in Iran and in South Iraq these are the people that said only Muhammad al-Baqir, Ali, Zayn al-Abideen, al-Hussein and al-Hassan and Ali are the true Imam from then on and then, then Ja'far al-Sadiq and then went on later on to al-Hassan al-Askari, Muhammad al-Mahdi, etc. and they counted 12 and they stopped there and after that they claimed that the 12th Imam disappeared into a tunnel and he is waiting who is al-Mahdi Muhammad al-Mahdi who, is, who will come back uh, at the end of time to correct the situation and that's what they called as Shia al ithna Sharia the, the Shia that only claimed 12th Imam 12th Imam and things will be rectified when the 12th Imam comes back but I want you just to kind of get an idea about the political and the religious atmosphere and 132 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, in that time there's clear division among the Shia and there's a great there's a clear division between among the Shia themselves and the Sunnah which is started to actually crystallize at that time and the differences were not as great as you would think today one of the known things that are no, that are documented of Imam Shafi'i when he was asked if he was a Rafidi now the Rafidi are those Shia he said, إِنْ كَانَ حُبُّ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ مَذَمَّتِي فَلْيَشْهَدِ الثَّقَلَانِ بِأَنِّي رَافِضِي He said, if the love of the house of the Prophet ﷺ is my problem, then let everybody know that I am a Rafidi. Of course not. But he was considered, they, they were asking him whether he loves the house of the Prophet ﷺ or not. But after the year, in this time, that's when the great schools of Islam started showing up. That's when the school of Imam Abu Hanifa started showing up. That's when the school of Imam Malik started uh, and then Imam al-Shafi'i and later on Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. It was towards the last days of the Umayyad dynasty and the early time of the Abbasid dynasty. And with that, I will stop inshallah here today. It's time for Adhan al-Isha. If you have a comment, Jazakallah khair. Subhana rabbika rabbi izzati amna sifun. Salaam alaykum. Now, it depends on, I mean, the word you are a Sunni and a Shi'i at that time was not really well known. Now, Al-Madhab Al-Ja'fari, what is known as the school of Ja'far, it belongs to Ja'far Al-Sadiq, who is the son of Muhammad Al-Baqir. Now, he had a school. He was an Imam. He had a school, a distinguished school of thought. But belonging to that school does not make you a Shi'i. And the school of thought that is recognized by Ja'far al-Sadiq is well recognized by many of the Sunni scholars but then later on it was deviated as, as it's to be Imam Ja'far he was uh, a descendant of uh, Sayyidina Ali and a descendant of Abu Bakr <laughs> Ja'far al-Sadiq yes. he was a descendant of Ali now is and, and I will I'll, uh, you want to elaborate on that or? he came from that's possible, I'll just have to look it up. Yeah, has to be. Uh, also, for the Shia and uh, the Ismaili Shia, they said that since Ismail is the oldest son, then he should be an Imam. And uh, the Prophet of Allah they say he didn't read in the book of Jafar, which is they start making things up. And Jafar was with the Imam Jafar, so that's why Imam Jafar is.
Yes, uh, just uh, really this to be a, a discussion about the Shia, and it turns into that. But what I wanted to just lay out is how th this is all about Bani Abbas. We're trying to talk about Bani Abbas. Inshallah, we will try to elaborate more about more the, these divisions later on. This is about how did Bani Abbas use that in their advance to power. This is what I wanted to really lay out there. Is they used that sect of the Shia, which is known as a Shia al kaysaniya which are the ones that pledged their support to Muhammad al Hanafiya, who did not want the Khilafah to begin with. But they still were grouping themselves, and they had an underground movement that we will talk about later on. And inshallah, the other thing we will talk about later on is the progression of al Umayyah dynasty, which really continued in Andalusia, it continued in Al Andalus, and that was this is also inshallah planned. But uh, we'll leave it to a different time. Jazakumullah khair. We're really late for Adhan al Isha, so yes.